to the Sequoia Show with serial entrepreneur and your host, me, Sequoia Mo Willis. I bring to you guests who discover key habits and success tips that they are sharing from their personal stories. Today's episode is titled Resilience in Your Journey. And my special guest today is Latiqua Golson. Latiqua is a mother, sister, aunt, daughter, granddaughter, niece, honest and trustworthy friend. She was born November 27, 1980 and was born and raised in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn and Tompkins houses, but spent most of her time in Sumner houses. She graduated with a high school diploma from Freedom Academy High School and completed one year of college at SUNY Canton. She is a proud mother of three beautiful children and a bonus daughter who she is currently raising. Latiqua's current position is a lead talent acquisition specialist for Continuum Global Solution, and her passion is providing job opportunities for individuals who want to provide for themselves and their family's needs. Latiqua's goals include writing books that will turn into movies and series based on her life's experiences, as well as traveling the world and encouraging and inspire others through motivational speaking. She wants to become a uh, owner of a restaurant. And one quirky fact about Latiqua is that she is a true Sagittarius. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Latiqua. Golson. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Hi, on sis. The show. You're very welcome. I, I, I um, I'm very honored because I know it's not easy sharing your story, but I also know that you are passionate about helping other people. So, with that being said, can you give us what the meaning of resilience means to you? What's the definition of resilience when you think about it? Um, being able to bounce back really quickly from anything um, traumatic, um, anything challenging, like being able to recover really quickly and just and just come back stronger. Yeah. And you are the perfect example of that. And I know that. Um, I know that maybe you don't feel that way every day, but every day you still get up, you go and you do amazing things and your children see that and other people see that in you as well. So what I want to do for the audience is I want them to get to know you and get to know your journey um, because there are so many people out there in this world who might be watching who might be sharing this with other people who might need this hope that you can give for them. And so with that being said, can you start with a little bit about what your upbringing was like? All right. So my upbringing was that of in Tompkins. Um, I grew up in Tompkins Projects um, between Tompkins, Sumner, and Marcy. Uh, I was raised by my grandparents. My mother was not around my mother and my father at that time. It was the 80s, so it was into that whole crack ep epidemic. And so um, me and my, my youngest brother, we're two years apart, um, we were raised by my grandparents. And mm -hmm. so um, we were quick to adapt to other people that were just like us, that were growing up without their parents, growing up without their grandparents, um, about without their families, things like that. So they, they took on a lot of the independency um it was just us me me particularly just figuring out how to live life mm -hmm. as a young girl in the ghetto in the projects um where you saw things like you know crackheads and 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 addicts and um you know going in the stairway and you would see alcoholics and drugs and it just was a part it was a part of our norm it was a part of my norm. So it was nothing out of the blue to just see things like that. But that's that was, you know, part of my upbringing. Um, I was very sheltered. My grandmother sheltered me a, a whole lot compared to my brother. Um, mm -hmm. So I was in the house before the lights, the street lights came on. I was that kid that got called out the window from 16th floor, you know, like, T, come upstairs. The, the lights are coming on, you know. Um, so I was protected. My grandmother tried to protect me as much as she could. So I really 
didn't have an upbringing of being outside with everyone else. That came later on as I became, um, I would say about 13, 14 years old. Um, mm -hmm. Me and my brother were put into foster care and um, that's where the real reality kind of hit. And I was pretty much by myself, like raising him, myself and my brother at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, there were families. There was, there was, you know, foster families and foster parents that pretty much was the, I would say um, the, the parents, right? But when we were let out into the world, you know, to go outside, we were back in the projects. We, that was our, that's our home. That's what we knew. So we would walk to the projects from wherever, we, whatever course the <laughs> home we would be, and we would we would walk to the projects, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how we learned how to how we learned Brooklyn that way. We were young. There was no, um, it really wasn't. We really wasn't big on hopping the train or taking the bus. We knew how to get there by foot, and we would pack little snacks, or we would steal from the store if we was that hungry and we didn't have it, right? We would put on our little backpacks. And mm -hmm. um, we would make it do what it do, right? We would we would just get to trucking, and the smell of you know the hood. As soon as we would approach it, it would either be Warhol Hospital, right? The clock from Atlantic Terminal. Um, those were our uh, skyscrapers, right? Yeah, so when we marks. saw those, right? Our landmarks, right, <laughs> right, right. And so when we saw those, it was like, oh, we almost there. We almost there, right? Yep. Um, and so my sisters which like yourself, um, they became my family. You know, we, we shared, we shared, I shared more um, of my feelings and my everyday with my sisters that I grew up with compared to my family, right? Um, my grandmother was old, my grandfather was old. Um, and so my sisters and my brothers in the hood, we would just hang out with by the basketball court, right? Mm -hmm. um, we would play football with in the snow, right? Um, yes. First kids, first first everything was in the hood. And so the hood, my upbringing in that factor was just like, everything was the hood. The hood taught me um, the experiences that brought me to where I am today. For some who didn't grow up how we grew up, independence has a different meaning or the way they got in onto that road of independence wasn't quite the same as like how we had to kind of especially as being the oldest, right? Um, uh, it, it, independence was a totally different thing because we weren't only caring for ourselves. We wanted to make sure our siblings were, you know, good, uh, grandparents, friends, our independence, the meaning of it is different. Um, can you tell us how that impacted you in like your teens and in your 20s? It made me grow up really, really quickly. There was, to me, the average um, teenage life or 20 year old growing up, you, you're still figuring out life. Having to raise my little brother, he was like, I was like his mother and his sister all at the same time, as well as his best friend. Like I can recall um, us teaching each other how to fight in the back room of the projects, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were just so tired of the same, your mother's a crackhead, your father was mm -hmm. this, um, you don't have these type of sneakers like us type of thing. And we were mm -hmm. tired of that. And so we we were each other's best friend. We would eat, I was his mother, I was his friend, I was his sister. Um, but the, the independent part is so different when it comes to me because it was survival. It wasn't mm -hmm. about being independent. It was about surviving. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I was snacks at night and we were we wasn't hungry, but we wasn't fortunate either. Like mm -hmm. we went to bed sometimes with um peanut butter sandwiches and oranges. Like my grandmother that like McDonald's wasn't a thing for us. Like these <laughs> kids have fast food so much. Like my kids are they are so they are so fortunate when it comes to that. Yeah. Like mom tired, I'm tired today. I oh, okay, we'll just go and get something to eat. Like that wasn't a factor. That That's that wasn't how we grew up, right? Um, I remember walking down the street with my grandmother and and and, and trying to zap, like like in my head, trying to zap the the McDonald's um cheeseburger wrapper in my head, like zap it into a real cheeseburger because we knew we didn't know what that tastes like, right? Yeah. We had real food. We had steak, white rice, green beans. 
And that was like the night, mm. right? And then for snack, we would have oranges and peanut butter on a sandwich. Like we didn't have those things, right? And so um, going into foster care and being stricken from that and put into a, an, into a, 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 a situation where you're in a different type of culture. So this different type of culture eats different things. And you're not used to that. So now we're going hungry, right? And so now yeah. it's time to get out there and do what we need to do in order to satisfy our hunger, right? So it was satisfy satisfying the hunger, right? Satisfying um the way we looked, right? And now it's not only me, it's my little brother, right? Um, and so this was a daily thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, fast forward in a little bit, um, uh, I was in, I remember being in group home at this time because you get to a certain age where um you just can't keep not coming home like foster care mm -hmm. system was like that like all right now you got to go into a group home you're this certain amount of age right now right so now you have to go to the next step because you're not listening to this parent you don't deserve to be in this type of environment so mm -hmm. now you were going to put you into an environment where there's a bunch of girls just like you right but they really wasn't like me my my people were like me right so now i'm in this environment and i'm I'm in a, in a home, in a house full of other females. My brother is now stricken from me. He's, mm. he's in a boys and I'm in a girl. And that took on a whole different, um, yeah. whole different mindset because now something that's familiar to me, the last mm. part of my familiar, familiarity, right, is gone. Because mm. now we're separated. Now I'm truly independent by myself. Now mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's men, um, there's mm -hmm. just me um, being in the streets to a certain different time. I'm taking off different type of levels of um, what's priority and what isn't. Do I finish school or don't I, right? Those type of things. And I remember mm -hmm. bumping into my mother who I haven't seen in years, right? Mm -hmm. Because she was at a stage where she would only come to the door, knock on the door and get a piece of chicken and a cup of ice out the refrigerator from my grandmother. Mm. Like that's how that went, right? And um, I remember seeing her while I was in group home, and then I took on a whole different level of now I'm her mother. I put my mother in her first rehab. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I was the one that um took my mother to the rehab for her cigarettes, laid up with her in the bed when she when she was shivering and going through those motions um, of now, of being an addict. Yeah. Let me ask you. So. Uh, two things, and I don't mean to cut you off. You can go right back to the spot sure. where we just stopped. Um, one, imagination played a big role during this this time for you in different ways, and we'll we'll get onto that. I just wanted to point that out because um, a lot of people who have to <laughs> push through certain things, the only way to see your way out sometimes is to see yourself in a different situation absolutely, and, and envision yourself there. Now, the next part is survival, right? You mentioned survival and you went into a group home. You're separated from your brother now. He, he and correct me if I'm wrong, was a main part of your your beat, your being like my goal, why I'm going to keep on go. Right. At that Absolutely. time. Mm -hmm. And then now you're by yourself. You're stripped from everything familiar, your grandmother, your brother, your friends. And now here comes your mother. And you're like, I'm, I'm going to help her. Why? What do you think it was not saying why, like something's wrong with it. Right. But what do you think drove that? By nature, um, and the grandmother that I grew up with, the same person that would say hello to people on the street that she didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, being around someone who was so loving and caring like she was, it was embedded in me. Like I had no mm -hmm. um, hatred. Mm -hmm. My mother was my mother. We, as a, as a, as any child, I think their longing for their mother is always embedded in them. Mm -hmm. No matter mm -hmm. if I if she left me at three at the doorstep or not, like it was always embedded. Like as soon as I saw her, it was just like a 
like a little, the little girl inside of me opened up like, oh my God, mommy. It wasn't like, what's up, ma? It wasn't like, it was like, oh my God, mommy. Like, there you are. You know what I mean? And, and let's get you better. Mm -hmm. Let's get you better. You know, and um, that's where that came from. Relief to You is one of our sponsors this season on the Sequoia Show. You can find out more about Relief to You by visiting their website, relieftoyou.com. Thank you, Relief to You, for sending these gifts for my interviewees and guests of the show. Relief to You is a natural brand that focuses on benefits instead of the prettiness, color, or smell of a product. It's about relieving the feeling you get from uncomfortable problems such as eczema, irritated scalp, dry skin, or painful conditions. We believe solving a problem in the natural world is how we stop bad side effects in the chemical world, says Relief to You. They sell the benefits. Try Relief to You today at relieftoyou.com. You can also get specialized or personalized gifts for goodie bags to give to your friends or just to put in your purse. Enjoy a 10% discount off of your order by using code new life and visiting relief to you.com. You can also follow relief to you on Facebook by going to relief to you or on Instagram at relief to you. Now back to the show. Okay. Okay. All right. So you were at, um, you're getting, you're laying in the bed with her. Sometimes you're getting her better. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So, so it, it, that level of becoming the mother, right? Mm -hmm. I became the dominant one in that, in that relationship with my mother. Like, I am the parent now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm caring for her. I'm bringing her um, all the necessities that she needs. I'm showing up for her. Not even realizing what I was doing. I just was doing it. Yeah. You know, um... When you say not realizing what you were doing, what do you mean? Because I feel like now at this age and so much experience that I had in my life, um, I went through a lot of different healing, a lot of different, um, and uh, I know we're going to get to that, but a lot of different things that happened in my life. And so now when I look back on it, um, I have forgiven her for, for, for leaving me at three just by showing up. Just by me showing up for her, I was showing her um, what it was to be forgiven, what it was to be um, mm. apologetic, like what it was to just like forget and move on. Have a clean slate. A clean slate. Mm. And, and that it you wasn't were open to her coming back in your life, like absolutely. Yeah. With no, with no, with no nothing, with no malice. At yeah. that time, it was with no malice. Like my, my main goal was, like I said, like it, this was the familiar part. My brother was not in my life as, as often as I would want him to. Of course, we saw each other on a regular basis, but now I wasn't taking care of him anymore. I was taking care of my mother. So it took on a other, another, another state now. Yeah. So around what age was this? Were you and your brother at this time? I would say I, this was about high school. So I would say about 16, 17. Mm. Now, you took on a role with your mom, like we all do, like you said, we see mom, because, you know, especially if they were hooked on substances, right? Um, and you, you kind of get to an age when you're around the age you were, you kind of get to a level of where you can understand a little bit, right? Um, yes. That people make mistakes. You still have questions, but you get to the level of people make mistakes and we want to give people a chance, right? But also at that age, you just kept going. Like you didn't give up. You always found another reason to keep going. One was your brother. Now you're helping your mother. Um, I'm sure me knowing you, you also want it better for your life and for yourself. You wanted to create a different story and narrative for yourself. And this is a, a way to take, kind of take control of that, even though at that age, we don't even know <laughs> what we're doing, but we're trying to do something. But you kept going. Somebody your age at that time, right now, 16, 17, 14, even our age right now, right? What would you say to them, to somebody who just feels like right now they want to give up? Keep going. 
like the, we don't know the end of the story. We don't know the end of the story. Like um after after that with my mom, like my she was better, right? She was she was now she was doing her thing. And um my main goal was to finish high school. Mm. Like a lot of people wasn't finishing high school. Um mm -hmm. so my main objective was to finish high school. And I had that was my next goal. Like I always had a goal. So if any anybody was is in that stage of like, I don't know, should I should not just keep going. Just keep going. But like Tiqua, um, but Tiqua, you don't get it. I'm I'm being the other person right now. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should I should be an actress, but I'm not. So I gotta do it here. <laughs> you don't get it. Like I everybody keep telling me they're here for me or they understand, but they really don't. And when I really need them, they're not around. You know, like you don't get it. Like nobody really cares. Nobody wants to help me. What would you say to that person who's who's saying that? Like easier said than done. Maybe that worked for you, but that's not working for me. People are not always gonna be there. Mm. That's just life. That's just the reality of it. You gotta you kind of gotta like do it for yourself figure out what is it that you want to do for self mm -hmm. everything else will come like because people are not always going to be there in our pre-interview you mentioned that about a time when you had your first child because you have children so now take us to that that part like when you had your first child and and you had a vision for your life prior to becoming pregnant Absolutely. And now you had your first child and that vision totally changed. And you felt like, you know, as far as your choices, you just didn't have a choice when it came to being a parent or a single parent. Can you, can you elaborate on that? So I went away after high school, graduating high school. Um, I went away to college. Um, and college for me was like, that was what was supposed to be done. When you finish high school, you're going to go to college. And it was like the most um, wonderful experience or most achievement I'm going to have in my life. Because mm -hmm. now this is something that I did for myself. I made this decision. Mm -hmm. There was nobody guiding my hand, telling me to do this. I did it. And I was very excited about it. I went away to um, SUNY Canton, upstate New York. It was miles away. It was far from the city. It wasn't a, a known school. Um, and it was another level of independence. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but nobody taught me and showed me what I was supposed to do when I was in college, right? Mm -hmm. So when things started to surface and the party started to happen, and, I, you know, it was a, it was like being away from home, being away from the city. So I, I didn't really stick to the classes and, and like I was supposed to. And mm -hmm. um, I wound up having to come back home. And then coming back home, I had my first, my first daughter um, at 21. And I didn't see my life that way. Mm. But it was a decision that I made. And I was now it's a whole different um I'm I'm caring for a being now at this point. I'm caring for my being. This is solely mine. Yep. And my vision um, then was getting with this person who was in this part of Brooklyn that was predominantly like this um, well better off part of Brooklyn. Clinton Hills mm -hmm. was like that that better off mm -hmm. part of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And um, me and her dad was like hitting a lot of so to speak, hitting the <laughs> jackpot, right? Um, yeah. We connected, We it was going to be a happily ever after, and that's not what happened, mm -hmm. right? Um, before she even was born, before my Maya was born, um, he was incarcerated, got locked up, right? And so now I have to go to work every single day. I have to save money. Um, I'm still in foster care. So now I got to save money. Um, oh, so you were get still out. in foster care at I that time? I was still in foster care at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah. what they call independent living. Independent living, probably. absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. yep, and they was paying all the bills and they were sending yeah. me stipends um, while I was in college. And then I had to come home because you can't live in college. Like when they had breaks, I was coming back to the foster care home 
um, and staying in, going back and forth and things like that. But now I wasn't going back. Mm. And so now I have to get a job. Mm. And um, that was my life. You know, that was my life. I worked, came home, saved money. Uh, eventually, I got my own place, you know, through a section eight pregnant. subsidy. I was pregnant, but I was pregnant then the whole time. I worked up until the last day of my daughter was born on a Monday. I worked up until the Friday. Mm -hmm. Like that's how my life was. Every single day, hustle, bustle. This season, The Sequoia Show is sponsored by Linda's Barbecue Sauce. You can find out more about Linda's Barbecue Sauce by visiting lindasbarbecuesauce.com. Linda's Barbecue Sauce is a black owned family owned business that's been operating since 2014 the company is family based so much that the brand was named after a strong mother of five children linda strive to love support and take care of her family the barbecue sauce is the foundation of their family strength hardworking ethics and principles linda's barbecue sauce comes in five different flavors pineapple jerk habanero mango peach honey and mandarin orange Thank you, Linda's Barbecue Sauce, for sending these gifts to my guests and interviewees this season. If you are looking for something to put in goodie bags just for your cookout or to have in your kitchen, contact Linda's Barbecue Sauce at 646 234 6352 or on Instagram by going to Linda's underscore BBQ underscore sauce. Now, back to our show. So, you're doing this by yourself. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, I don't want to use the word forced into it, right? But at that time, we feel like I have no choice. <laughs> I'm forced into this. I got to do this by myself. It's one thing if I'm doing it with a person. It's another thing when I'm doing it by myself. Do you do you think you put some things on the back burner or push some things to the back? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I pushed um, finishing school to the back burner. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like my my minimum goal was to do two years. That mm. went completely out the window, right? Yeah. Um. Even with work, you know, being taking certain types of positions, when you have a kid, you can't do that. You're limited because the well-being of my child comes first. I have to show up for her. There is nobody. Of course, it was my, my mother at the time, his family, but it, there was no one like mom. Yeah. I had to do, I was... Because of my upbringing, I needed to be there for my kid. There was no leave her here for a little while, come back and for a couple of days. There was none of that. There was, I'm mom, and I have to do what I have to do for my kid. That means protect her, clothe her, feed her, shelter mm -hmm. her, everything. And nobody taught me how to do none of this. Mm -hmm. Again, with a, like you talked about, the imagination comes in at what I saw on TV, you know, what I saw other people do. A lot of it was TV. A lot of it was like the hugs to pools, like whatever we grew up on. It was like me taking that and implementing it into my life and raising my first kid. Nobody showed me how to do any of that. I know growing up, a lot of people want us to get our heads out the clouds and all of this other stuff. But for a lot of us, that saved our lot. Those clouds were softer than... Any pillow we laid on. So with everything that you just said, like you had to be resilient. And it's like almost in every aspect and piece and stitch of your life. A lot of people get tired, right? They're like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. Um, you know, why me? Why is everything happening to me? And and they just cannot dig deep down and find how they don't even know how to be resilient so i'm gonna ask you again now because sometimes we know our story and we don't think it's as awesome right because we're like listen <laughs> i wouldn't give these shoes to nobody <laughs> right like you don't want these shoes you don't even want to steal them if i put them down you <laughs> you can't dress Might them with nothing walk over those <laughs> yeah <laughs> walk up burn them right <laughs> you dress the hell out of your shoes with every little thing that you had nobody knew if you had the how you got your stuff nobody knew how you kept pushing through nobody knew what your why was give us again what resilience is like thinking about everything you did or had to think about had to imagine had to push through 
what does resilience mean to you when you think about all of that stuff? Because I want Man, I want it's... somebody out there to understand mm -hmm. how to how to have some resilience, how to get that. There's no time to sit down for too long. Mm. I, there's no there, for me. There, I'm not gonna say there's not crying moments. There's no time to sit for too long. Like stuff mm. got to happen. Mm. I got to I have to snap back. Like what's the next what's the next thing? What's the next big thing? Like what all right. I done talked about it. I done cried about it. Um I'm living through like what is next? It's always the what's next. I'm just not sitting for too long like that. Resilience is that bounce back. But with all the challenges, all the trouble, all everything, it's like, this can't be it. Where is the hope shot for me? All right. So you have more than one child. You have you have more than one child. Fast forward us. Bring us up to all of your children. Oh, man. <laughs> so I have my 21-year-old, which is Tamaya. Um, I have my Jada who is 12 now, and I have my son, my son, Sean. He's Gerard Jr. He's nine. Um, <laughs> I never would have guessed that I was going to have, I was not planning on having any more. Um, and then you meet the person who you didn't know was going to be your everything. And, um, we just wanted to make it solid. We wanted to make our um, our connection together and more based. And it was it wasn't even like like. And I need to go back a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, my husband was. I met him in the in the same projects that we grew up in, and um, it wasn't one that I was looking for um, at the time. I was moving and grooving, you know, mm -hmm. I still had that, that hustle in me. I was still, I was, you know, um, but my fairy tale was always that of the girls who had the big earrings, who had the guy with the flashy cars. Um, that mm -hmm. was appeasing. That was, um, that was what I wanted. I wanted what they had, you yeah. know? Um, and I didn't always feel like a pretty girl. Um, I felt like the pigeon, right, who later became the dove. So um, I didn't see myself as that. Um, and so a lot of the things and the movements that I went around, it was more or less like me. Um, trying to get, trying knowing that I had this power as a woman, right, to get what I want from a man. So it was mm. never really based off of um, anything that had to do with like love and falling in love and there was always one, you know, you have that one that you coming out of teenage from, from young girl into teenage. And it was, oh, it's so love, love him. I can't do anything about without him. And mm -hmm. had the whole tattoo stage and it was <laughs> going to be forever. And then, of course, you know, life takes on a different chapter and that happens. And then and then now I'm I'm 24. I'm 24 because my daughter, Samaya, was four at the time. And I meet this guy. And um, he just thought I was the most beautiful woman to him he had ever seen. And mm -hmm. um, I remember the day, you know, having on, and it was, it's so ironic like now to remember everything, but I had on a Marilyn Monroe dress. It was like a white halter <laughs> dress and um, it was pure white. And I had like, my hair was always natural like this. And um, he was like, you're gonna be mine one day and we're gonna have a bunch mm -hmm. of kids. You know, and I was like, get out of, you know, get out of here. Like, I'm not, I, I don't even know <laughs> you. You know, like, you know. Uh, but, you know, the universe said otherwise. And um, we were together and, and he showed me all of those things. He was my fairy tale. He was that fairy tale of a person. Like, um, I know I was telling you before, we used to, he used to take me out to restaurants and I was a big, big person on take, get, take me out. Like that was my fairy tale. God always taking a woman out. Mm -hmm. And um, we would go to like these restaurants. Restaurants was our thing, just trying different stuff. 
and um, I would go to a restaurant and I would eat something. I'd be like, I, I don't like this. I wanted mm -hmm. to see his reaction and it would be money to pay these, you know, to go. One of the places was like Michael Jordan Steakhouse, like mm -hmm. places I've never imagined or, or even thought about going. I would like, ah, eat the steak like, ah, get out of here. I don't like that. <laughs> Give me something else, you know, and um, it wouldn't move him. He would just be like, bring us something else. And that for me was just like, mm -hmm. you know, um, we wanted to build our bond. And I know for quite some time we couldn't have Jada. And I had Jada 10 years later after my first kid. So it was like, my was forced to like a whole six years later I had Jada. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, like when you're with someone, you know, there's, a, there's that many years, like we were together 15 years. And so with that, there was a lot of, there was a lot of ups, but there was a, some downs in there too. You know, you're growing with somebody um, who yep. you have to accept their flaws. They have to accept your flaws. You know what I'm saying? So we both had our, our, our flaws, but we were together. Like we, we were really like that. Um, I would, I would like to say we was that couple that people really adored and really, really wanted to achieve to be, you know, we had, there was nothing that I didn't ask for that I didn't get ever. Um, I was really, really spoiled. Um, <laughs> two years after having my daughter, my son was not expected and we were ecstatic. I remember being in the hospital room and him slapping me five, like some real TV shit, you know, <laughs> him slapping me five, like, yeah, we got our son and like him being so ecstatic and so happy. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, like, like my children are like, like, um, anyone who knows me know that the love that I have my, for my children is completely selfless. Um, I sacrifice a lot for my children. Um, I would like to say it's because of my upbringing, but it's because of my love and heart as well. Like um, there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. And that's that like many parents, women, people can say it, but if you know me, know me you know that there is nothing in the absolutely world I wouldn't do for my kids. And I know you. So I know that is like yeah. more than the truth. It's facts. Right. So speaking about your independence and remember in the beginning, I said, you know, we kind of learned it a different kind of way. Right. Um, maybe before we thought it was abnormal, but then we find that there's more people like us than, than not. So, but either way, we developed our independence and, and, and walked in an independent role for a very long time. And sometimes even your upbringing or just things that we learn along the way can affect or impact relationships. Now, did your independence impact or affect your romantic relationship in any way oh and absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um my husband was the type to do everything right he he was the cook he was the clean i was the cook <laughs> um and so he would take care of the kids he showed my my babies he would bathe the babies right um i would like to say he was the hustle when i was the brain so mm. everything that I didn't do, he did, but would also, it felt like he was taking that woman, motherly part of me away because mm. he was doing so much. That part of my independency. Because right? he was being and a it, good dad and husband. Awesome. I mean, <laughs> like, it was, it was unimaginable. This is not stuff that I saw. Like, again, mm. the imaginary part, this was not a part of that. Mm. So you got a, a, a man that's not only providing financially, he's in a home providing. He's taking my children to the movies. He's showing up for their plays. He is mm -hmm. the dad that goes on the trips. Um, he's the dad that's providing the food before I hit home. Yeah. Like there's food already there. You know, yeah. babe, it's all right. They good, they ate already. Just go ahead, go take your shot. It's Ooh. like, it's nothing for me to do. What are you doing? Sounds some so woman good. would, it would <laughs> sounds amazing to some, but you're talking about a person who did everything her whole life. 
and a person where people were taken away from her or she was taken away from people. And now you have a grip on some little people that are yours. And, and, and again, like you said, with the imagination, right? One thing about imagining things or envisioning things or meditating on things is that it helps you prepare for those things. So because you weren't like already thinking about this, imagining this happen, you, you just wasn't ready. You wasn't ready. I was not ready. (laughs) <laughs> at all at all so um, so it, 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 go ahead go ahead it just it just did something different um hold on a second it just mm-hmm. did something different um i didn't know how to sit down i didn't mm-hmm. know how to accept it embrace it um and let things be I yeah. needed to have my hands in it some way because I felt like you were taking something from me that I should be doing. I should be contributing back in some kind of way. Yeah. So, Do you think that you eventually started to develop a softening and a balance during that relationship? And if you did, or if you think so, because I don't care what you said, I know, I know I saw it, right? And yeah. <laughs> But how do you think you got there? There are a lot of people, a lot of women, a lot of men, just a lot of people in general who we've all gone through things or we, whether we went through things or not, we develop certain habits. Even if you're being, you're, you've been single for a while, or you didn't depend on anybody for a while. And then now you get with someone and they it don't, it doesn't work for a very long time because it's nobody wants to give a take. Um, mm-hmm. But you stuck in there and he's stuck in there. Mm-hmm. Do you think there was a softening and a balance? And how do you think you got there if you think if you do think so? I agree. There was a balance and there was definitely a softening and a balance. Um, but mm. a lot of people don't want to hear the part where you need to talk to your mate. Like mm. conversations is necessary. Yes. Um there would be he was big on that. He was mm. really, really big on, you know, we we've gotten to a point where some sometimes I had a wise person tell me, you want to be happy or you want to be right. Mm. And so when I heard that, I was like, sometimes you need to listen. And listening can be a gift. You know what I mean? So I would have to absolutely sit down and like literally sit on my hands and let him speak. You know, and and, and vice versa. You know, um, because we were both those type of people that wanted to be heard. And I always wanted to be right. I don't want to be happy. I want to be right. So it took a lot of conversation. It took a lot of sitting down and just listening to each other's wants, needs, desires, um, how I feel about a certain situation, how he feels about a certain situation. Um, And yeah. It's a lot of conversation. So communication is key. Conversation is key. The desire to want to move through it because I want to be with this person. Um, So sometimes I have to do some self-reflection and we have to do some relationship reflection. I have to hear and he has to hear. Now, you recently went through some things and a lot of people who go through as much as what you have gone through they just don't move forward or they're just here and i i want you to be able to tell the audience how you how you move forward no matter what even though even when you don't feel like it And I'm right here with um, you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have a problem talking about anything when it comes to the most the most traumatic situation that has ever happened to me in my entire life. I think um, what makes me the most resilient is this situation. Um, mm. Back in 2020, my husband was murdered. To be riddled at t- 10 o'clock that night 
you know, from your whole world just completely turning upside down um, was something that I never imagined. This was something that I never, I couldn't prepare for this. I was not prepared at all. Yeah. I went through a life of where it was one where I felt like I was living in a book, a book mm -hmm. that I had once read before. Yeah. I'm going from different Airbnbs, you know, with my children. So now in a shelter, which feels like a group home, which feels like foster care all over again. Mm. So it feels like I'm going backwards. You know, mm. we're sleeping on bunk beds when we went from a four bed, a three bedroom apartment. So this is very unexpected. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like the whole part of it, just not just, just period was just like total unexpected. Right. And, um, to have it, to, to, to have your world turned upside down like that and then to have to go to Airbnbs and out of shelter uh, and like I'm in a fight again. I'm mm. in a fight again. And I'm fighting burying my husband. Yeah. Burying the one person who I absolutely hold in my every being of myself. And he loved me with every being of himself. And now I have to I'm not only crying, I'm showing up for three babies. These yeah. are my kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? These are our children. Yeah. Because he didn't yeah. call my daughter. My, my oldest was his baby. She was never looked at as a stepdaughter. He raised her from four. So mm. these are four children who have also experienced their own level of trauma. Yeah. And now... The, the head, which is me, having to show up for them, rub their backs, dry their tears, as well as my own, all in while burying them, you know? Mm. Um, so when a person says like, like they've been through some stuff, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't really, I can't really get with that one and say, not like me. You, you can't, you couldn't have, because it was, it's a whole different dynamic. It's not just that. My mother is now gone. My grandmother is gone. And now my husband is murdered. So this is and, a whole different dynamic. And that happened not far apart. Well, within a three years time, two years prior to my grandmother passing, my mother passed of lung and throat cancer. And these mm -hmm. are major people in one person's life. Like you're talking mm -hmm. about it's a mother who birthed you, right? My grandmother who raised me and then the person who showed me so much love that I didn't know I had could show, could be, right? All in this time frame. My grandmother passed in January and then my husband was murdered the same year, months apart in March. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was a whole different bounce back. And not only are you dealing with each one of those people, each of your children are dealing with each one of them because everybody was close. What does healing look like for you? I have beautiful women in my life, not just my sisters that I grew up with. Um, I have support groups. Um, I seek outside help. I go to therapy. I have a psychiatrist. Um, mm -hmm. I make different type of meetings via Zoom or in person. Um, it's self-care. Mm. You know, um, just recently I decided to do some physical self-care. Um, because like my children only have me mm. at the end of the day. I need to I need to kind of protect the spirit, the physical and the mental part. Um and so the spirit and the mental part is, is something that I do, do on a daily basis. Yeah. I'm constantly in prayer. You know what I'm saying? And that absolutely gives me the strength to keep going every single day. Yeah. Um, I believe that my God has a certain, certain place for single moms mm. that, that try every single day, no matter what, that I show know. up every single day. Yeah. Um, because that's what I do. And I only I not only do it for my kids, I do it for a lot of other people, but on a daily, the processing part of the healing, to answer your question, is daily meditation, um, a lot of prayer, 
outside help mm-hmm. and a support network. I, I really, really believe, like I have women in my life that are single. I have mothers in my life who are single, parents mm-hmm. raising their children. Because I need to identify with those people. I need yeah. I need to share my story and I need to hear from them how they get through it. Because that's not, one side of the story is just not my story. There's other people's stories and collaborating. I raise my children. There are men in my life that, mm. that show me how to raise my son. But I had to be like really open to it. Um, I had like grief takes on a whole, like many different stages. And right now I believe I'm at that acceptance part. It took a minute and it's still fresh. Some days I'm still angry. That's just part of, just part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, it's three different sets of people. It's not just my husband. His was just the most traumatic. So there's different feelings each day. But um, I read a lot of self books I do a lot of meditation I stay in prayer and um the healing process is like all of those things collaborated like you really you really wear the crown well sister tell the audience like what what you do in your career talk about your aspiration all right so um I am an HR recruiter for um a company that is has contracted has a contract with 311. And so um, my daily, daily job is to help people get jobs, to hire them. Um, My day-to-day is to call and do interviews to assist people with customer service, um, getting a job with customer service. Um, 311 is an information line, so it is just specifically for to give information about anything that's going on within New York City. Um, I hire a lot of different people. Um, In my orientation, I will tell you that um, it doesn't matter your race, creed, color, religion, sex orientation. Like if you qualify for the position, you have two years experience of customer service, high school diploma, GED, like the minimum requirements, I will hire you. Um, I feel like everyone, needs an opportunity and a chance to better themselves as well as to provide for their families. Um, it didn't always start out that way. I was, um, I have managerial skills in my background, um, but I started out with this job just going through what people may know as workforce one or the welfare assistance, right? Government assistance. Now, tell us about your inspirations. What are some of the things you want to do? what you have planned to do, if you are open to sharing? Oh, man. Um, One of them being um, to write a book or to write a few books um, or to do a screen, a screen, turn my books into play, not plays, but more or or less on a movie screen. Um, I feel like I have a lot of different ideas in my head. I put like so much um, life experience, but also... um, life, imagination, creativity. Um, So I really, really want to write a book, one on my my life experience um, with family, but also with sisterhood. I think I have an amazing story that I want to just talk about in different, um, because there's different sets of sisterhood. Like I have my sisters from Sumner. I have my sisters um, from Tompkins. I have my sisters from college. I have different sets of sisterhoods. And um, I think each one of them could absolutely be a great book, a great movie. Um, so that is absolutely something that I wanna, wanna do. But currently what I wanna continue to do is just um, advance in my career and just stay um, inspiring others through my story. Like they don't have to settle at the bottom. Like one thing that I didn't mention, which I really, really do not want to forget, is that um, I started through Workforce One, right? And I started there first. And in my presentation that I give in my orientation class, I tell them this. I have a high school diploma, which I'm very, very proud of. 
um, but I have one year college. I never went back to school to complete college. Um, I do want to do that one day, get some, do some online classes um, because I have my children, right? But I do want to go back to college. Um, but I say all that to say, like I have the one year experience in college, but I'm an HR recruiter. Like I'm the team lead in, my, in, in the Brooklyn area for my company. Um, there is no limit. Long as you get up every day, you can do it no matter what. And in my presentation, um, in my orientation, I absolutely tell them that. Like no matter what you want to do with what little you have, um, you can do it. You can be whatever you want to be. Just show up every single day and put your best foot forward and put your all into it. Like everything else will will happen for you. Um, and I believe like that is the part of, you know, that's what makes me so resilient. You know, that I just keep showing up every single day, no matter what. And I'm not only um, and an, as an inspiration and, and a, a model for my children, an example to them, right? But I'm also an example to people at work, people in my support group, people that ever come in contact with me. Um, if ever I'm willing to share my story, I have no problem sharing it. It's not something that um, depletes me. It doesn't make me any less. Um, it actually um, gives me room to grow. It, it helps me grow a little bit the more that I, I, I can talk about it. So, yeah. Absolutely. Like, and you're amazing. So with your amazing self, <laughs> I want you to talk to the Latiquas in the audience who may not know what they are going to have to go through, um, who may go through some things in the future or near future and they don't just don't know how they're going to go get through it they don't know how to keep going i think you said a lot of it during um this interview but i want you to make it personal to because i feel like it's somebody i feel like it's somebody watching or who is going to watch this who is going to be so inspired so i want you to encourage them um and for all those who are listening or anybody who is inspired by this, watch this over and over again. Take one of the things that Tiqua says and say it to yourself over and over again. But I'm going to give you the floor again before I take the floor because I have something as well. Okay? Okay. All right. So I want to just say um, to anyone that's listening, uh, Every day, try to get up for gratitude. Put one foot on the floor, you know, before you open your eyes, give whatever your higher power is, give them the utmost thank you. Um, express a lot of gratitude, whether it's just gratitude for you waking up, opening your eyes, having those five senses, right? Um, show up no matter what. Cry it out if you need to cry, wherever it is that you need to be at, and you must just let the tears flow. I believe um, crying is definitely cleanse, can cleanse the spirit. Um, and no matter what is going on, it will pass. Like if it's really, really difficult, no matter what will happen, it would eventually pass because it, it can't always be bad. It can't always be a down part. It can't always be the light's dark. Eventually the sun has to shine for things to grow. And so to anyone that is... um struggling um reach out to those people somebody some if it's that one person um if you don't have that one person try to find something right about it um just release it release it as best as you can but try to try to find that one person or group of people that you can identify with and just share what you can because when when it's released it don't have no room to grow after that you know so that's what i would say Girl, that was deep. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now um, number one, Tiqua and myself may be watching this. If you are watching it on the same day that we drop it, you'll be seeing those flyers come out. Links will be presented. Um, there will be things in the posts or the description box if on YouTube uh, where you can click on and um, 
Tiqua, I know that right now you don't have like a link or anything for anybody to reach you or contact you. But if anybody wanted to email you and just ask you anything, would they be able to do so? And if oh, so, mm -hmm. let us know what that email address is and it will definitely be linked in the, in the description box. Um, I want to thank you so much for sharing so much of your story and your journey and for inspiring and encouraging the audience today. And hopefully one day I'll be able to do this in front of a large studio audience. <laughs> but today I want to present you with the New Life Star Award. Oh, that's so and nice. The New Life Star Award is presented to overcomers and agents of change who uplift and inspire others. And you do that not just for us and your friends. Let me get a good camera shot. And so this would be coming to you. But this award, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do a lot for people in your life, regardless of what you're going through, your children, people on your job, and you do it from a place of good intention. Like you really, really mean it. And, and the things that you want to do, you, you're still not thinking of only of yourself. And you've been doing that since it was just you and your brother. You've been doing that. And I've watched you with your grandmother. You were, you've been doing that with your mother and you were in foster care, you were in a group home and wanted to leave out, but you're always taking care of other people. And so New Life and myself want to make sure you're on it and want to take care of you. So you'll be getting this in the mail along with some other gifts and I'll let you know when I send it. Nice. Thank you so Thank much. You. For you're welcome. Thank you're you. Welcome. <laughs> so I will put all that information in the description box, everyone. And Tiqua, thank you so much for being here again. And I love you. Anytime. Love you too, sis.